next uh, speaker is going to be Nancy Egan, and she is from uh, 3D Robotics. So I'm Nancy Egan. I am the other Egan. The Egan that is not Patrick Egan. And the Egan that's not related to Patrick Egan. Um, I am the general counsel and executive vice president of policy for 3DR. I am not by training a policy person. I am by necessity a policy person. Because when I started a year and a half ago with 3DR, we realized we'd entered into a really crazy time in the history of drones. It wasn't the beginning. Drones have been around for a long time, but we were seeing really exponential growth and potential. So I was drafted into being a policy person. And it, it's a role that I actually love, and I was up here all day. So I assume somebody's going to tell me when I'm running out of time. I'll give you the time. Thanks. Um, I'm also happy to take questions at, at any time. Well, some of my friends from the micro arc are here as a general class. I see Doug. That was a bit of a free for all, so why not just continue? Um, so, I also have to figure this out. So, so the scope, what are we talking about? And I'm really preaching to the choir here. We all know that the market is evolving, it is, it's, it's growing rapidly. And we've been, 3DR, have been using this chart unchanged. For years, um, we're very much in the consumer space as that was growing more quickly, primarily because of regulation. And we've been trying to get ready for the exponential growth in commercial use that's been trailing primarily because of regulation. And we think we're at the precipice. We think that the final rule coming out is really going to open the doors for a lot of folks to get into the industry, um, and, and we'll see gigantic growth. I won't bore you with this stuff. I'm sure you've read it. The market will be the market will be huge. Uh, from a policy perspective, that brings it along a lot of challenges. There'll be a lot more people in the air. The makeup of the folks um, sharing the airspace will be different. It will no longer only be band aviation, and it will no longer only be you know a drone every now and again. I actually don't see that many. I call it drones in the wild. I rarely come across people using drones. I'm not doing something drone related. Uh, I recently was in downtown San Francisco and I was driving up Knob Hill and I saw a guy standing on the corner flying over traffic at the Fairmont Hotel. And it was a random and very odd sighting in the wild. And then kind of an acres won a rush hour over traffic. <laughs> Only if you're legal, if you're hot, it's not dangerous. Exactly. That's the standard for, for danger. Thank you. Um, the FAA sees the change coming, and I would posit that they are not afraid of the change, but they recognize the need to manage it, and manage it in a way that balances a lot of different constituencies. So, and you know, Jeff had a great presentation. He talked a lot about the details of, of what's, what's on people's plates right now, what the Senate is doing, what the House is doing, what localities are doing. So I'm going to take it up. Up a level. Um, I could leave the details to the true experts and I'll just talk in, in big, sweeping, gold type language. Um, what are we trying to achieve? And by we, I mean the drone industry, I mean the manned aircraft industry, I mean the regulatory um, bodies, the FAA, the legislature, and the public at large. So I'll posit that the industry goals are safety innovation, and certainty. We're all for safety. We all want to be able to innovate without being hampered. We don't want the legislature to tell us what equipment we should be using or what technologies we should be using. That will slow us down. And we want certainty. We want to know what, when we can fly. Um, while we talk about rogue operators, 99.9% .9 of us are law-abiding citizens, and we want to have some certainty so that we can comply with the law. What's government goals? Well, government wants safety. They want innovation. We want our economy to grow. The FAA is going to hamper innovation. They want us to have the safest vehicles out there. They want to be able to use them for safety purposes. You know, intentionally, this picture is not of a drone. It's 
face of a guy doing something that I could never, ever do in a million years. And that guy is at risk. And if he used a drone, he wouldn't have to be at risk. So that's another safety case that the government and that the regulators are happy to look at. And the FAA wants certainty. They want to have enforceable rules. They want to be able to communicate enforceable rules. What does society want? Looks a lot like the other two sides. Society, they want safety. They want to be protected if they're on the ground and something's flying overhead. Um, that guy, I'm sure, would like other options for doing that job. His employer would like other options for doing that job. Um, innovation, you know, people are nervous about drones, but we were nervous about phones on, or cameras on cell phones. We all seem to have gotten over that pretty well. We like innovation, people want innovation. And society wants certainty. They want to know what's permitted and what's not permitted. They want to have some sense that that guy flying on the corner in Knob Hill is acting under some rules and regulations so that he's safe. Right now he's not, probably because he, like, there isn't anything for him to, to act under other than to just not fly, and that's not great. So let's just review. Society goal, safety, innovation, certainty. Government goal, safety, innovation, certainty. Industry goal, safety, innovation, certainty. None of these things is not like the other. They're all the same. So how hard can this be if we all have the same goals? Well, let's talk about how hard it can be. Um, I recently was the chairman of the the industry chair, so the co-chair of the micro arc. And that was convened by the Department of Transportation and the FAA to get some guidance from industry on how, what structure can we put in place to allow drones to fly over people. Um, we had a great group of people across a number of different, across a number of different constituencies. We had the toy folks. We had manned aircraft people, we had unmanned aircraft people, we had folks from industry setting organizations, we really, we had airport executives, we ran the gamut. And I would say, at the beginning of the process, we were all pretty unanimous in our goals. So again, how hard can it be? Uh, so let me tell you a little bit about some lessons that I learned. If the FAA calls you and asks you to be the chair of an ARC, Think once, think twice, but then agree to do it. Because while it was one of the hardest things I've ever done, it was, it was a truly amazing experience to sit in front of the room and have the responsibility, or feel like I had the responsibility, to make sure that everyone had a say. Whether I agreed or disagreed with the position, whether it was a popular position in the room or an unpopular position in the room, uh, it was a fantastic, it's a fantastic opportunity for me to actually get to understand every, every viewpoint. There's some other things that I learned if you're going to be the chair of an FAA advisory rulemaking committee. First, eat fast. This is my lunch. Everyone else went out to lunch, and I felt very sorry for myself every day when I went got my peanut butter and jelly sandwich and my water while I prepared for the next session to make sure that we were somewhat organized. The other is um, take good notes. So this is a picture of a whiteboard. I understand everything on that perfectly. It makes complete and total sense to me. At some point, I walked about, you know, we had about 15 chairs on each side in a big U-shaped table. I walked about 10 chairs in and realized we could not read any of that. I had been writing on that board for a day and a half, and nobody told me that they could not read a single thing. So <laughs> I'm certain that they all understood it. But as soon as I got away from it, I, know, I, couldn't, I couldn't read it at all. Um, so, so while I, my point is that the goals are the same. So how do we bridge the gaps? Well, what are the gaps? If the goals are the same, what are the gaps? And here are my theories. These are my theories, open to suggestion, throw out your own theories, happy to hear everybody's theories. But there is a fundamental, difference in the mindset and in the two different on the far ends of each um, of the spectrum. There's the airman mindset and there's the roboticist mindset. And an airman mindset is very much focused on the human and the pilot in command. In 
a pure roboticist uh, focus is focused on the computer and taking the human out of it and actually believing that the human is the weak link, not the safety net. Neither of those positions is wrong and neither of those positions is absolutely correct. And that's where we have to start bridging, bridging our conversations. And so for the folks here, a lot of you straddle both wor worlds. You have a, an airman background, and you are a drone operator and understand the technology. But in these two worlds, there are a lot of folks who are on either end of the spectrum. And then we're communicating with legislatures, legislators who aren't anywhere on that spectrum. So I think we really have to, when we're talking to each other, and particularly I have found, um, as a person from the roboticist side, when I'm speaking to regulators, it's really important for me to understand the airman and the pilot and control um, philosophy. And I really found to embrace it and to carry it over to my ro roboticist colleagues because it is true that when you have an operator, that operator has to be in control, that operator has to understand the fundamentals and the environment in which they're operating. It's really important to the conversation for the roboticist to understand that. It's also really important for the roboticist to try and to talk with the airmen about the fact that there are things, there are fail safes that are better built into a computer than counting on a human. And with each generation of technology, we're getting, the technology gets better and better and better. And I think we have to be very cognizant when we're talking to each other um, about policy, because sometimes we're coming from two very different places. Um, it also drives all the safety decisions. So I don't come from a, an aviation background. And as I started talking to regulators, there's one person in, in, uh, in particular took the time to walk me through the Arabic perspective. And not because I met this before this theory that I've so brilliantly come up with. He actually took the time to show me his flight manual. He'd been a commercial pilot. He pulled out his flight manual. And he showed me, and I might get the terms wrong, but he showed me the ditch protocol. And it's literally loosen your tie, take the pens out, take the pens out of your pocket. This is what your plane is going now. You're a commercial airline. And, and he said they drill and drill and drill. And if your plane is going down, like I'm sure Sully, when he got off that plane, I haven't gone back and looked at the, looked at the videos, but I'm sure his tie was loose and there was no pen in his pocket. Because that's the protocol and those are, those are really important. So when you talk to an airman, it's all about the pilot and drilling the safety culture and the safety steps into the, into the pilot's being. When you talk to a roboticist about safety, they'll talk about fail safes. They'll talk about, well, the drone will return to home. It's all built in. The pilot has to do nothing. But I do think it's true. It's, it's Great as I think the solo product, project or product is, and as terrific as the Phantoms are, and the Inspires, and all those products, we're still in a position where you need airman knowledge. And it's important not to forget that and to keep that in the conversation. So safety is really important. And when we're talking about policy, we have to acknowledge from every perspective that we still do have humans. We have to be open to the possibility, actually it's not the possibility, it's coming, where we will have drones that don't have a human operator, but we've got a lot more steps to get there. And I think looking for, from the airman perspective and understanding those tried and true safety procedures and emulating them through technology is, is a great approach. Or at the very least, being able to describe your technology fail safes in a way that airmen can under and understand and relate to. The other is that this, this difference in the way we talk about things and look at things leaves some legislators unclear on the safety case. So legislators do not fly drones. Um, tried as I might, I have been able to get the drones in the hands of a single congressman. Um, so that they know what they're legislating. And this is not a criticism of Congress because, you know, those folks, tomorrow there's a sewer bill. I don't expect them to go down in the sewer, right? And today is a drone bill. And um, since I've been working with Congress and working with the staffs that do develop some expertise, I, I find them to be super.
super smart people, hugely um, intellectually curious, and really trying to do their best from a policy perspective to meet the goals that we all have in common. You're just coming from a different perspective. Um, and some legislatures, legislators, Senator Feinstein, for example, wants to tell us which, what technology we use and how much technology we need to operate the drone. Um, other, the, the, the FAA actually says, look, we'll put some operational limitations on you. We will assume that the drone might hit someone or something, and so we'll set some rules to avoid that. We'll put a person in charge of that drone, and we feel okay about it. We're not going to regulate right now that you have X, Y, and Z technology because we think like airmen. Right now you need a pilot to get, I don't want to put words in the FAA's mouth, it's even get, maybe that's too much. We do want people to be, have a, a knowledge, take a knowledge test, have a certain amount of knowledge, and, and that'll, be, that'll be funny. So they are, the FAA is taking an airman perspective and understanding that technology will evolve, that evolve. But you've got a legislator, legislators taking a roboticist view of it and saying we must have all this technology for these things to be safe. Still, we've got to bridge the gap. We've got to make people understand that there's two, two things happening here. Uh, the other thing, the other gap that we have um, that I have on is very much the man versus unman um, areas of the industry. I think both of them, we are definitely all in the same industry. They're two different arms. I think the lines are the lines are quickly dissolving as more of the manned aircraft folks are starting to say, wait a minute, we see the utility of these drones. Um, the Helicopter Pilots Association have said, look, you know, we're gonna we're gonna stand up a division for drone pilots because our guys don't want to be hanging, they don't want to be flying over that power line either for the safety of the helicopter operators. And so we're seeing more understanding, but at the same time, people are, I would say, vigorously defending their space. Um, and it's a healthy debate. The man folks say, listen, I've got 373 souls on board and I'm responsible for them. And I take that responsibility very seriously. And for that, I thank them, because I'm often one of those people. Uh, so what we need to do is keep that conversation open and convince those airmen that we, as roboticists, who understand aviation, we understand the rules, and we can think like airmen, respect their concerns and deal with their operational uh, requirements. And we cannot just say, look, nothing bad has happened yet. And that is just, my heart stops every time someone says that. I almost feel like putting bad stuff out in the universe. So, but I think these lines are blurring as, as uh, the folks who currently fly manned aircraft are becoming more and more familiar with the technology. So the task we were given at the ARC um, was to state requirements in terms of required results without stating the methods for achieving the required results. So again, that is a good combination of airmen versus roboticists. So we want required results without stating te the technology or exactly how we're going to get there. What is the level of risk that we are willing to take? And then what do we do to assure that people don't exceed that level of risk? Um, when we looked at risk, this is a example of factors that I can use. I stole this from the FAA, this is not mine but I lost their logo when I, um, when I put it up. This is a chart that the FAA uses for manned aircraft and all different sorts of risk assessments. The goals on this chart, while some of the factors aren't relevant to unmanned aircraft, the goals and the thought process are completely applicable to manned aircraft. So again, the, the gaps are not that big. So what we did as an ARC is we started here. We said, this is, this is how the FAA looks at risk. We, don't, we're, we are inventors. We invent flying robots. We do not need to reinvent this wheel. This wheel, this risk assessment, 
make sense for man as well as unmanned. Um, just move some things around and think about it. We were specifically looking at risk for flight over people, so safety of persons in the air wasn't in our purview. It's not to say we didn't care about it, it just wasn't what we were thinking about. Um, but again, bridging the gap between airmen and roboticists. This is an airman risk analysis, completely applicable to unmanned aircraft. So before I go on to like my big picture, what I would ask of everyone here, um, I purposely did not get into the results of the ARC. You know, there are four categories. I'm happy to talk to people about it and talk to you about it for hours on end. But what I really want the takeaway from this to be, just like Jeff said, he wanted you to be an advocate. What I'd like for all of us to be is super effective advocates by understanding how other people are looking at the problems, understanding that we all have the same goals, and as we encounter folks with different views, trying to put, um, trying to use the language of folks who have very legitimate concerns with the airspace. So if you have questions about what the outcome of the arc, Doug will answer them, General Foss will answer them, I'll run high. But um, what I really want you to think about is, so what? Like, thanks for all this high-level stuff, so what? So this, stolen from Apple, think different. What I'd like us to do is think of it differently and act. So what I mean by that is, you know, expand. Approach all of our operational issues and our policy issues from all sides. So as you are out in the world operating, keep in mind that the goals of the public, the goals of the policymakers, and the goals of the operators, and the goals of the manufacturer are all the same. Safety, innovation, and certainty. And every time we're out operating, we're sending a message to the public. We're sending a message to the legislatures. We're sending a message to the media that these are safe operations. These are good for the economy. And in fact, the world is a safer place with drones than without drones. Because that guy is going to fall off that tower if he's using a drone, or fall off that helicopter. That helicopter is going to touch those power lines if it's not flying over the power lines. So engage. And this is Jeff's point as well. Don't count on me or Jeff or anyone else to solve the policy issues. We all have to be part of the discussion. You know, like, if you all want to go visit your congressman in Washington or in your home districts, that's great. But we also are part of a policy discussion every time we fly. Every time we fly and other people see us fly, we're getting, and we do it safely, we're getting one step closer to public acceptance of drones as a great part of the economy. Talk about it, talk about it to your friends. And, as Jeff said, take the next step. Call your congressman. It works. So I now go visit congressmen, which I think is funny. I had never done that before. Um, and I wait for them, sometimes two days away. And I listen to the legislative aides in the offices take phone calls. And it matters. You know, folks call, and I was in one office one day, and they said, you know, ma'am, the senator is opposed to closing Guantanamo. No ma'am, no prisoners from Guantanamo will be transferred to Kansas, we are certain of that. And these are the kinds of things people call about, but they get noted. They get noted on the law. And if nobody calls about drones, the congressman thinks nobody cares. So we focus our um, efforts on folks on the subcommittee and folks who are you know, writing the law, but we should each be calling our own congressmen because at the end of the day, they all have votes. Educate. Uh, lawmakers have never flown drones. We talked about this. Lawmakers make laws about lots of stuff. They can't know everything about everything. Uh, I had a, a congressman come visit our office about two weeks ago. We put our drone in his hands. We let him fly. He was amazed. Shocked and amazed that this is it, this is how easy it is, this is how safe it is. Within five minutes, I can fly safely and feel comfortable. I said, absolutely, absolutely. Really changed his view, changed his view a lot. So to the extent you can get people, members of the public flying, your friends and family flying legally, hopefully soon that will be super easy to do. 
Um, do it. All right, one last thing. Um, the public does not understand the vast benefits. Because we, we all, have not done a good job telling our stories. We've not done a good job telling the story of um, environmental activism, uh, you know, counting fish. We've not told good stories about the, the benefits of drone use. So I would ask all of you to be out telling your good stories. Make sure the public knows there are vast, vast economic benefits and public safety benefits from drones. This is on us, all of us.